Well, welcome everyone to the coffee seminar. My name is Luis, Luis Prada e Silva. I'm a principal research fellow at the Center of Animal Science, and I'll be facilitating the seminar and the discussions today. Uh, the reason I'm here is not only because I'm the principal, a principal research fellow with Coffee, but also because of my role on the Australian Association of Animal Science, which we call AAAS for short. And this will be a AAAS themed Coffee seminar. We had our conference last week and the three speakers today, they presented at the conference last week. So um, Harry and, and Craig and the group, they thought it would be a good idea to, to have a triple AS uh, theme seminar. So look, before, um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continued cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Just uh, housekeeping before we start with the presentations. This seminar is scheduled, as you know, from 12 noon until 1 p.m. And we will we'll listen from the three speakers first. And at the conclusion of uh, all the seminars, we'll hold a question and answer session. So please keep, uh, type your questions as we go, but they will be answered at the end. And please use the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. And please do not use the chat button for that. So, all righty, I think we're good to go. The first speaker today will be Dr. Karen Eyre. And Karen has a PhD from the University of Queensland in Rumna Nutrition. Uh, I'll not tell you when she got that, because that will tell her age. But she got a PhD in Rumina Nutrition, is currently a postdoctoral research fellow working on the MLA funded Calf Alive project, aiming to increase calf survival in the northern beef industry. And part of that project is using natural abundance of nitrogen isotopes to identify more efficient cows in Northern Australia. Please, Karen, I'll stop sharing if you can share your screen. Looks good. Take it away. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the screen sharing. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction, Lewis. And this is a report that was presented at the AAAS conference last week in Cairns. Um, thank you, Lewis, for putting that on. He was the president. Uh, this work was done at Burley Reef Search Station in 2017 and 2018 by Roger Hegarty and Lewis. Okay. So um, in Northern Australian production systems, we often rely on low quality pasture during large portions of the year. So we ask a lot from the cows in this region. They're generally in late pregnancy um, and early lactation during the driest part of the year when the pasture quality is lowest. And you can see the group of cows and calves there and it's looking pretty rough. Um, and we expect them to rear a calf to weaning and then get back in calf during this period. So some cows can do this very well and they maintain their body condition score when the pasture quality is low and then they have better milk delivery and they're more successful at getting pregnant again. So we do know that some animals can cope with low protein diets better than other animals. Um, so they reduce the urinary nitrogen losses and recycle more nitrogen through the hepatic system back into the rumen. 
And once it gets back into the rumen, it can be used for microbial protein production, which is then used for um, either, it's in, used for amino acid synthesis, which can be used for growth, or in this case for milk production and growing a calf and reproductive performance. So we know that there is a variation in how animals can do this and some animals are better at it than others. So we need to be able to identify those cows that can maintain their body condition score on the low quality diets while successfully rearing a calf and getting pregnant again. Um, we need a method that can be applied to large numbers of animals and can be utilized to test the performance in the harsh environment that these animals are expected to produce in not on research stations. So one possibility is using the naturally occurring nitrogen isotopes, nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. So dietary protein is made up of these two isotopes. Nitrogen 14 is lighter and it's preferentially utilized by both microbial and hepatic enzymes leading to isotopic fractionation. So this leads to greater excretion of nitrogen 14 in the urine and enrichment of the body tissues with nitrogen 15 compared to the dietary isotopic profile. In more efficient animals, less nitrogen 14 is excreted in the urine and thus there is a lower amount of nitrogen 15 in the animal tissues. Now you can use a variety of animal tissues to measure nitrogen 15 levels. Um, most like plasma and um, muscle samples and things measure the nitrogen 15 at a certain period of time. So we are using tail here and in doing that you can actually go back in time and get information for the length of the tail here. Tail hair grows about one centimetre every 14 days. So you can figure out when the period of greatest nutritional stress is and count back and analyse that portion of tail hair. Um, you can see on this picture that you collect the tail hair and the bulb is the end that is attached to the animal. So we pull that out and then every two centimetres we've allocated to a month. And you can figure out at what time things happened. There was a big rain event in February 2019, and that's shown on that tail here. So we could count back in time to November 2018 and say, well, that was the period where those animals were under greatest nutritional stress and analyze that portion of tail here. And that prevents us from having to go and collect a plasma sample or a tissue sample at the exact time when the animals are under stress. This means that it fits in with current management practices at the stations. We can collect the tail hair during routine musters. Um, it's nice for us if it coincides with the driest part of the year, because it's much easier to cut tail hair from the bulb end than it is to count measure back and cut a segment out further down the hair. Tail hair collection is minimally invasive for the animal. It's easy to collect. Uh, you don't have to have any special skills. It's easy to transport and it's easy to store. So what was done was there were 680 cows and heifers at Burley Station, which is near Richmond in Queensland. Um, they were Brahmin, Brahmin Cross, and it was a mix of cows and heifers. To measure the reproductive efficiency, the cows were given um, one point for pregnancy and one point for lactation. So if they were pregnant, they got a point, and if they were lactating, they got a point at each muster. So there were four musters, and they could collect a maximum of eight points. And this developed a reproductive performance index for each cow. Now, that reproductive performance index does not take into account the weight of the calf at weaning or the age of the cow. So there was no points given for if they were a cow or if they were heifer. Now they were divided into two groups. The high efficiency group had a mean number of points of 4.88 and they ranged from four to six points. The low reproductive efficiency group had a mean of 2.81 and that ranged from 1.3 to four points. Now, there was a subsample of 23 animals from each group where we collected tail here from. 
And these tail hairs were then cut into seven sequential 20 millimeter segments and analyzed for the nitrogen isotopes. So you can see that we collected the tail hairs in 2019, uh, counted back. There was a big rain event in two, February 2019. So we wanted to analyze the particularly interested in the data from the driest part of the year, which was November 2018 and December 2018, which is when those cows were in late gestation and early lactation. So this was in the results. The cows that were assigned to the high efficiency group had significantly lower nitrogen 15 levels on their tail hairs. So um, this was particularly the case in the driest part of the season. So those November 2018 and December 2018 values. You can see that the two lines are the furthest apart then. Um, as the pasture quality increased and the nitrogen efficiency, so the nitrogen use uh, even more efficient animals start to excrete more nitrogen. The, <coughs> sorry. So as the nitrogen use, uh, the pasture quality increased, the difference between the two groups disappeared. So in February 2019, when there was that big rain event, they no longer were significantly different. And as you got into May 2019, where the pasture quality was starting to decline again, there was potentially some more differences between the groups as they started to separate again. Now, there was no difference in body condition score between the two groups. So the high efficiency group had an average body condition score of 2.7 and the low body condition score group had an average body condition score of, sorry, flip it around. The high efficiency group had a body condition score of 2.7. The low efficiency group had a body condition score of 2.3. Those were not significantly different, but we need to remember that the high efficiency group is um, producing more milk and growing more calves. So they would have a higher protein and energy requirement than those low efficiency groups that are maintaining only themselves in some cases. Okay, so this is very encouraging results. We found that the nitrogen 15 concentration in the tail here was correlated with increased reproductive efficiency. And so this has the potential to be used as an indicator of predicted individual reproductive efficiency in cows grazing low nitrogen pasture. So what we plan to do now is to collect um, tail hairs from heifers so before they are either pregnant or lactating and analyze those, uh, find a section of the hair that correlates to the lowest quality time that those heifers have faced and then see if that predicts, keep a track of their reproductive performance and see if we can use the nitrogen 15 as a predictor of their future reproductive performance. So um, we gratefully acknowledge Meat and Livestock Australia who funded this work and Alistair McClymont and the Burley Station staff for all their help during the trial. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. All right, so if you have questions for Karen, please type those in the question and answer button. All righty, the next speaker will be Noman Nassen. And Noman, if you want to start sharing your screen, that'd be great. Uh, Noman is working as research officer at WAFI, Center for Animal Science. He has submitted his PhD thesis and is waiting for the outcome. We all hope it will be a good one. Before that, he graduated with Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and then completed a master's in veterinary pathology. Noman has seven years working experience in veterinary pathology and have good skills in animal disease diagnosis. In the future, Noman is eager to work in advancement of animal disease diagnosis and prevention. And today, Noman will be talking to us about the research he presented in Cairns last week 
on the hypersensitive immune response in the development of buffalo fly lesions in North Australian cattle. Please, Norman, go ahead. Thank you, Lewis. Um, thank you for the opportunity um, uh, to present here again. Um, today, I'm here to present one of my PhD uh, research aspect in which we explore the role of hypersensitive immune response in the development of buffalo fly lesions in North Australian cattle. So buffalo fly is a small uh, blood feeding ectoparasite or that feeds mainly on cattle and buffalo. And buffalo flies were accidentally introduced in Northern Australia from Asia in the uh, mid 19th century. Since then, uh, this, uh, buff these flies have been creeping southward through Queensland to Northern New South Wales. And uh, this southward spread is supported by climate change. Uh, these flies causes uh, heavy economic losses of about $100 million per year for Australian cattle industry, especially in terms of decreased production and uh, high, high cost of control. And the heavy uh, buffalo fly infestation also present an animal welfare issue. Uh, skin lesions associated with buffalo fly feeding uh, are named as buffalo fly lesions. In Australia, uh, buffalo fly lesions are manifested most frequently as a dermatitis or lesion on the medial canthus of eye, neck, and ventral midline. And this also uh, presents uh, animal welfare concern. These lesions can range from raised, dry, uh, hairless, hyperkeratotic, or scab encrusted areas to severe uh, hemorrhagic uh, areas of ulceration. And Johnson reported up to 95% of cattle uh, affected with buffalo fly lesions in North Queensland. So uh, as the uh, buffalo fly lesion is a, like, like a issue for a long time, but it was is like the cause of this uh, uh, buffalo fly lesion was still not clear. In the start, development of these lesions is associated with buffalo fly feeding but we have found a poor correlation between buffalo fly number and the lien development. And then in 1980s, a filarial nematode, stephanofilaria, uh, which is vectored by buffalo fly, has been implicated in the development of these lesions. But we have found that this nematode is not necessary to initiate the lesion development. So we have also identified two bacterial species, Staphylococcus agnetus and Staphylococcus hycus, from buffalo fly and both from flies and lesion. And these bacterial species have been potentially found, found uh, involved in the pathogenesis of these lesions. But the question raised from the observation that not all the cattle in a herd acquire lesions, even in the peak buffalo fly season, and this could be. Uh, this difference could be due to the difference in response, host response in one or more of these factors involved in the pathogenesis of these lesions. So this study was planned to, with the objective to identify the role of cattle immune response in the pathogenesis of uh, buffalo fly lesions. For this, uh, 25 Brunga steers phenotype for two years for the buffalo fly lesion development were divided into two groups. Uh, cattle with high lesion in last two years are categorized as susceptible for the lesion development and cattle with uh, without a lesion or with zero lesion in last two years are categorized as uh, uh, resistance for the lesion development. Then we prepared a soluble extract of buffalo fly, house fly, and Oncocerca gibsoni, and uh, we uh, like we substituted on or uh, stephanofilaria antigen with Oncocerca gibsoni in this study, and then each steer was injected intradermally with three different concentration of buffalo fly antigen, and two concentration of house fly and Oncocerca antigen, and we injected 0.1 ml PBS as a negative control. And we uh, measured the skin, th skin fold thickness before injecting these antigens. So what we have uh, noted uh, after the treatment 
We measure the wheel area around each injection site after one hour and skin fold thickness was measured at 24, 48 and 72 hours of post inoculation. We also collected biopsies at 72 hours of post injection from the five highly sensitive animals and processed through histology to identify the local immune response. We also collected blood in duplicate before and after 24 and 72 hours of post injection for differential leukocyte count and uh, serology. Here I would like to mention we didn't find any difference in blood and serum. So uh, all the findings we have uh, are very much localized, which I'm going to present now. So after one hour of uh, uh, injection, lean susceptible animals have uh, uh, significantly higher wheel area around all the injection site as compared to the linear resistant animal. And after 24 hour uh, skin thickness response in lean susceptible cattle was significantly higher to all doses of buffalo fly antigen as compared to the lean resistant animal. And similarly, skin thickness responses in lean susceptible cattle was significantly higher at both doses of house fly antigen as compared to the lean resistant animal. And a similar response was also recorded after 48 hours of post injection. After 72 hours, susceptible uh, cattle showed significantly higher skin fold thickness response around all the buffalo fly antigen injection site as compared to the linear resistant animal. And as, uh, like the similarly, um, we have observed a significantly different uh, skin fold thickness response to the house fly or musca domestica antigens. But although the skin thickness response in lean susceptible cattle was significantly higher at four doses of uh, house fly antigen, but it, it, its intensity was low as compared to response to buffalo fly antigen. So uh, the most interesting thing which we have found is the cross changes that we observed during this study. After one hour of, uh, um, especially in the lean susceptible animal, after one hour of post injection in lean susceptible animal, uh, especially around the 100 microgram buffalo fly antigen injection. The injection site was turned red and there was seepage of some serous fluid from the injection site. And after 24 hour of injection, there was seepage of serous transutate drying up on the surface of buffalo fly in, uh, injection site in the lean susceptible animal. And then after 48 to 72 hours of injection in five highly sensitive or susceptible animal, we observed that there is uh, the superficial epidermal layer was lost around the 100 microgram buffalo fly injection site. And there was development of dry serous crust over the buffalo fly injection site. So we collected biopsies from those five animals and process uh, with histology. We have found that there was uh, acute uh, Partial to complete, uh, partial to complete epidermal necrosis in all the biopsied sensitive animal with ulceration extended to the superficial dermis involving hair follicle damage. Those affected areas are superficially covered with the serocellular crust of varying, varying thickness between 400 to 500 micron. And uh, this uh, crust have a cellular, cellular composition comprising of Necros epidermal cells, uh, neutrophil, and eosinophil. <coughs> there was, uh, we also observed um, uh, was moderate to uh, severe edema in the superficial dermal layer, and that indicate um, severe inflammatory responses, uh, which lead to the collagen uh, uh, damage and the hair follicle damage in the superficial dermal layer. And these damaged hair follicle leads to the hairless area even after healing. If we talk about the uh, cellular characterization of this inflammatory response, it was uh, comprised of the severe acute diffuse infiltration of mainly neutrophil and eosinophil, indicating uh, characteristic hypersensitive inflammatory changes in the uh, in the res in response to any insect antigen. So the key message that we got from this study was uh, lean susceptible cattle had significantly stronger hypersensitivity response to buffalo fly antigen as compared to linear resistant cattle. Although we recorded a significant uh, 
skin thickness responses difference between these two group with house fly antigen this and this is because of the close phylogenetic relationship between the buffalo fly and the house fly and the skin responses cross and the histological changes all these indicate type 1 hypersensitivity reaction in lean susceptible animals that cause acute to subacute uh, necrotizing neutrophilic eosinophilic dermatitis and as the antigenic antigenic stimulus persist this type 1 hypersensitivity reaction might proceed to a type 4 or a late phase reaction of type 1 and these findings suggest that the differences in hypersensitive response to buffalo fly antigen may underline the differences among cattle susceptible to lean uh, development and further characterization of this response may help in identification of biomarker for selecting uh, lean resistant cattle with this, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors and my lab fellow. And I will also acknowledge uh, uh, our field staff from Panjara Hill and our uh, Branga Steers who contributed in this study for the last two years. I would like to acknowledge University of Queensland, Queensland Government Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and Meat and Livestock Australia for their uh, financial support for this study. Thank you. Fantastic, Norman. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, again, please uh, pop your questions for Norman on the question and answers button. All right, our last speaker for today will be Mr. Latino Coimbra. And Latino, if you want to share your slides, that would be great. Uh, Latino presented this poster, it's an electronic poster last week at the Keynes conference. Latino is a PhD candidate, uh, actually enrolled with the University of New England. But fortunately for us, Latino is doing his research here at the uh, University of Queensland. And his PhD research project involves uh, measuring milk yield of tropically adapted cows from neonatal calf growth. Go ahead, Latino. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, yes, uh, I'm a uni student, but uh, within three years, I'm here in Gatham with uh, Luis, as Luis has, uh, is my uh, supervisor. So most of the, my PhD research project I conducted here in um, um, UK Gatham campus. So, the one that I'm going to present today is, uh, is one of my uh, PhD research project, which is uh, experiment two. So firstly, I wanna share the reason why we are doing, we are interested to do this conduct, I mean, to conduct this experiment. So previous studies mentioned has been uh, reported that, has reported that uh, in the dry tropical areas, there is a high beef calf mortality rates. So most of the calf mortality uh, were happened uh, during the first week of life. And they were also uh, found out that the major risk factor is to be low milk production and delivery during the first week after birth. Um, and then also um, some studies report that in tropical, um, Dry trop in drop, dry tropical areas, some of the cows were not uh, produce enough milk in the first week after calving, or some of the cows were failed to produce to start their lactation, and this problem caused dehydration and reduced milk immunoglobulin transfer. Then it can increase the risk of the risk of calf mortality. So. Back to the uh, milk production and milk delivery. Monitoring milk production in tropically adapted boss indicos, such as Brahman cows, is quite difficult. So, that's, therefore, the objective of uh, this study is to validate a practical and cheap method to measure milk yield in boss indicos cows that can be applied in the field. In these studies, we use 24 newborn calves. And after calving, within three days, the, the newborn calves together with their mother to make sure that the cows 
consume enough uh, colostrum. And in this experiment, we use four treatments of uh, milk volumes, uh, which is the first one is 2.3 kilogram per day, uh, 3.5 kilogram per day, 5.5 kilogram per day, and 7.5 kilogram per day. So this treatment, treatment of milk, uh, calculated based on the calculated based on the metabolizable energy requirements for a 35 kilogram dairy calves. So to attain um, 50 gram per day and 40, 400 gram per day, 800 gram per day, and one kilogram uh, gram one uh, one kilogram per day. And before we allocated uh, the calves into a, into each uh, a treatment, we decided that the first twelve newborn calves will be based on the we will we will allocate in the, into a one of four treatments based on the birth date and the next 12 newborn calves were allocated on the sex this the reason is to balance the group and the total intake uh, of the milk was adjusted based on analyzed wholesale milk composition and estimated brahman milk composition approximately the fat comp composition of the brahman milk is 5.7 and during the experiment, all of the cows we were, were weighed three times per week. And the average daily gain was tested using linear regression analysis. And the, and the relationship between Brahman just milk intake and energy was, was analyzed using linear regression analysis. So what we got from this, this, this study As we can see from this graph, that there is a strong linear relationship with, between milk intake and calf growth. And uh, for each liter of milk, there is an increase about 200 gram per day increase in average daily gain. In the field, as the calves are growing more than 700 gram per day, the cows produce more than five kilograms of milk. This means that the cows require high energy and protein. And also in this graph, we can see that to maintain or to just stay alive, a calf need 1.94 kilogram of milk. So the conclusion is that based on the results, we can conclude that the growth rates of both indicus calves in the first week of life can be used as an accurate method to monitor change in milk delivery of dams. So if anyone wants to, to monitor the milk production and milk delivery of both indicus cows in the field, you can weigh the newborn calves and then use my equation that I have to calculate the, how much milk produced by the, by the dams. Thank you. All righty, thanks a lot, Latino. I guess you can just, oh, okay. You close that, I was gonna, so you could just leave that there, but uh, that's all right. Uh, so now I think uh, we're open for a question and answer session. So please put your questions there. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to start with Noman. Yes, sir. All righty. No man, really interesting results. And um, one question is about the allergic response of the animals. Was that only to the flies and not to the nematode or bacteria, or is that um, was that also part of the allergic response? 
So in this uh, study, uh, we used lab grown flies, which uh, which which were now never exposed to cattle. So there is a minimum chance of maybe no chance of getting the nematode or uh, bacteria, which we were we have found in the field flies in those flies. So that was a pure uh, response to the buffalo fly antigen. And uh, we also found there is a response, there was a response to nematode antigen, but that was not, uh, there was no difference in response between the lesion susceptible and resistant group. There was a response, but that was not different between the susceptible and, and resistant group to the nematode antigen. And, uh, but in, for the buffalo fly, it was like uh, there was a significant difference between the lesion susceptible and the resistant group. So that was something that determined uh, by the host of the buffalo fly antigen. Right, thank you. Karen, a couple of questions for you. Uh, first one is how large was the sample? And how many animals in the high efficiency or low efficiency group in the whole sample uh so there was 23 each that were done it for the nitrogen uh isotopes in the tail here so 23 in the high and 23 in the low and uh, another question is uh, the other factors that could be affecting the isotopes and ben hayes is asking about the age was were the results confounded by age? Was there any difference in in the age or the year on the tags uh, between the two groups? I don't have the information for the age on the two groups, but there were, would have been a confounding um, effect of lactation on in the two groups. So obviously, the way they were selected meant that the low efficiency group had less lactating animals in it and the high efficiency group had more lactating animals in it and okay. lactation is a drain on 15n so um but there were 18 lactating in the october 2018 muster there were 18 lactating and seven non-lactating in the high efficiency group and they found that lactation status had no effect on the 15N concentrations in, within that group, but we couldn't compare it between the two groups. Now, we're going to try and remove the confounding effects of age and lactation by collecting the tail hairs from heifers before they're pregnant um, and lactate or lactating, so hopefully around joining. All right, thanks. Uh, question for you, Latino. Question from Lex Turner. He's asking, you're saying that you did this study because there is a high calf mortality in dry tropical areas. Would you be able to tell us an industry average for the calf mortality? Yes. Um, yes, as I said, the calf mortality um, rate in the tropical um, beef cattle system is, is high. Um, for example, in a, in my country, in East Timor, and also part of uh, Indonesia, uh, which is West Timor, the um, calf mortality rates uh, was uh, more than 30% per year. Um, and also some literature report that the, in, in Northern Australia, um, it's around 16 or up to 20, 20%, but as uh, some uh, reporters mentioned that it would have been decreased up to 5%. But still, uh, the calf mortality uh, is still a, a big problem for a tropical beef uh, cattle system. Thank you. All right. I think the numbers we're working on is about 11% mortality in Northern Australia. The bad areas in Northern forests can be, as you said, uh, 15 or 16%. Yeah. Good. Um, another question for you, Noman. 
how did you before you start the experiment how do you separate the animals into successive susceptible or resistant so um for this uh, we have record we phenotype those animals for two years quarterly every like every three months we phenotype for the lean development and uh, we record the lions like the, the lean area the severity of the lean and then uh, after two years we give them a rank and then took the, the extreme phenotypes like the who that never developed the lean and then or like those who like develop the lions or they have the lions always have, yeah, like the big lions Okay, good. There's some noise around you, Noma. Karen, a couple of questions for you as well. Uh, Paul Gautier is, is asking about uh, if the variation in the Delta 15N could be explained by the variation in the diet. And uh, would you obtain the same response if you plot the, the Delta considering the diet instead of just uh, the, the minor delta, not the capital delta, uh, just look at the, <laughs> at the natural enrichment. <laughs> and how would you correlate that with the protein content? So the point of the question is about the diet effect on the, on the isotope ratio. Yes, so diet selection has been proposed as a reason that these animals are more efficient so that they select uh, better quality uh, diets from the legumes and grasses that are available to them in that environment. So um, we also looked at the carbon isotopes that were on the tail here in order to uh, address that question. Now, there was no difference in carbon isotopes between the two groups. There was variation between animals and it did vary between um, times of year. So as it rained and legumes became a more prominent part of the diet, the um, carbon 13 on the tail here decreased. So that indicated an increasing legume intake, but there was no difference between the, the high efficiency and the low efficiency groups in that. And previous um, work with GPS data show, looking at um, uh, grazing behavior and diet selection has also shown that there is no difference between heifers that have different residual feed intakes. Good, and a follow-up question will be, if you would expect a variation on the fractionation, the 15N fractionation by protein metabolism because of other environmental factors uh, besides the protein content of the forage? Uh, possibly, it could depend on um, heat and microbial composition in the rumen, but we're not sure about that. But we will. We will, we are looking into it. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Uh, Noman, question for you from Lax Turner. Have you looked to see if the sensitivity to buffalo flies reduces with age? Um, this is something uh, sensitivity, uh, we did not observe that, but in, in the older animal, we have observed the bigger lions. The, the in the older animals but uh, once the lean drop it started getting the other factors like i told you the nematodes the bacteria and the other factors and they keep uh, ex exacerbating the situation so uh, but this is something uh, the sensitivity in in these two years i did not observe that the animal remained the same level of sensitive like Okay, thanks. Uh, Latino, another question for you, because I know you love uh, these uh, tricky questions. Uh, so based on your results, uh, Brahman cow is producing five liters of milk or even more than that during the first week after cowing. 
is that in agreement with uh, with the literature? And what can we do with that information? Yeah. <clears throat> the treatment that I had in my experiment, we have uh, four treatments. Uh, one of the treatment is 5.5 uh, liter of milk per day. And um, if we look at the uh, dry matter uh, content in the milk, it's uh, 40%. So in this case, um, one liter milk, which is contained- Yeah, uh, sorry, Latin, I think I will stop you there. Um, I think that the question is uh, a cow is yes. producing five liters of milk on the first or second or third day after birth after yep. calving okay yes is that a new finding that you are reporting to us or has this been shown before and think, why is this important to know that uh, a cow is producing this amount of milk i think this is a new that we got from uh, our experiment that uh, if we uh, uh, connect with the uh, uh, the growth of the calves in the field which is more than 700 grams so the, the, the cows producing more than five uh, liter per day. So this is the new that we got from our experiment. But yeah. All right. Good, thank you. All righty, I think uh, we've answered all the questions and I appreciate um, everyone that put the questions on the, on the chat or the question and answer button. And uh, unless, you have any last uh, statements to make? I think we can consider this the end of the seminar. Thank you all for coming. Lewis, if you're able to just introduce next week's host, that'd be fantastic. Well, that's good, James. Thanks. So, yeah, please come for the next seminars. That will be by Dr. Inigo Osmendi about the understanding tree and fruit growth through modeling. Thanks for that, James. Thanks all for coming, fantastic presentation.